Cause like a winter Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. We have a great show. Today we're going back onto the psychology of religion, tackling some of the difficult questions with Reverend Michael Whitfield. Thank you very much, Reverend Whitfield, for joining us. Thank you, sir, for having me. Reverend Michael Whitfield is the senior pastor at New True Faith Mission Baptist Church in Compton. Reverend Whitfield, how long have you been a reverend? Well, I've been preaching now probably for about 19 years. I've been pastoring a New True Faith Mission about the church going on my third year. Third year? As a senior pastor, 19 years ministry. Oh, well, I was a minister up under Bishop Marquera Broadus for about 13 years. Uh, then H.W. Johnson was probably about for the other five years. Then now I'm, wow. I'm a senior pastor. Senior pastor, wonderful. Well, thank you so much again for joining us. We're tackling some of the difficult questions we always try to get answers for. First one up to bat for Reverend Whitfield will be, what does God provide us that we can't get anywhere else? A lot of people wonder, do I need God in my life? Some people who are very successful, who are very wealthy, sometimes think, I don't need anybody. I'm fine. And some do, but some don't. So the question I have for you today, first one, is what does God provide us? That would be a very hard question for somebody. For me, it's very, very simple. God provides several things for us. Number one, he provides love unconditionally. Imagine, God gave up his only begotten son, that who shall believe him should not perish but have everlasting life. And not even that, he provides peace. Can you imagine when you're going through trouble in your life, you don't know how to deal with your situation, and God sit there and give you some calm and peace. That's true. That's a very, very comforting thought. Um, it almost sounds like he's the ideal parent. Well, he's more than a parent. He's our father. Our father, the one that, who created us from nothing and made us something. God took something. He knows everything about us. Now, one of the things you might want to know, why is it that God doesn't intervene when I do bad things? Simple. God did not make us a, like a computer or a robot. God said, I'm going to allow you to think for yourself. So he gives us free will. Free will. That almost leads me to my second question, but that's a little too soon, so we're not going to get there yet. <laughs> <laughs> now, God provides us peace and comfort. He provides us security. I think you yes. already mentioned them. And how does... Can you, can you think of any situations in your life where God provided you with, with, with that peace and that solace? Yes, this is something I shared with my church on just a couple of days ago. And we had a great spiritual time. And somehow something came over me, and I had a flashback of my own life that I remember that when I was actually sleeping in my car and f went to church every Sunday, went to Bible class every Wednesday night. So the Lord blessed me. And one day I remember telling my pastor, my senior pastor, Bishop Rollins, I said, Bishop, I want you to know something about me that you probably didn't know, that I've been homeless for the last three months. He said, Whitfield, I never knew. You come to church every Sunday, Bible class every Sunday, like nothing in your life is going on. What I do and what I did, I trusted God. I knew I got myself into it, but God was able to get me out. And that's exactly what happened. So you were actually homeless for three months? For three months. We are over three months. I was three months in my car. Three months in your car. Now, you actually have a program that you do in your church for the homeless. During yes. Thanksgiving. Yes, we have a program now that had been on my heart since I became pastor about three years ago. And last year, one of the members, we was at a guest church, took a young lady home. And the thing that was, the, my member called me, said, Pastor, I'm upset, I'm disturbed. And I asked my member, what's going on? She said, I took this older lady home, and on the way there, she stated that she didn't have nothing to eat. She wasn't for sure was she gonna have Thanksgiving dinner. And my thing is, how can a person be by themselves on that day? So this year, God bless us. A lot of donation from Gersh and Baker or Park Newport, a donation from Grace Temple, and donation for other churches, and that we are able to feed over three to five hundred people. Three to five hundred. Three to five hundred. Wow, that's amazing. Amazing, and I thank God for it. I wow. even thank God for giving us that task. 
it's a, it's a wonderful task. Um, senior citizen, and those are dis disabled, we would take them their food for them for free. The food is free, and we'll deliver it to them for free. Wow. Now, we're going to tackle that in part two of this show. We're going to talk a little bit more about what does God say about helping those that are unfortunate or going through tough times. But before we get to that, I actually want to backpedal a little bit, and we're going to find out what made Reverend Whitfield become a reverend. You know, that's a great question, because I did not want to become a preacher. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if you guys ever heard that before. Uh, I wanted to be a, a boxer. I, I wanted to fight Mike Tyson. And when I went to the military, <laughs> I'm from Arkansas, and, and I had to box. And the drill sergeant asked me, who taught you how to fight? I said, I taught myself. He said, have you ever thought about getting on the fighting team? I said, yeah, I might think about it. But my grandmother used to tell me <laughs> that the Lord got his hands on me to be a preacher. And holy, it ends up that God called me to preach. And when you are called by God, it's a burning desire inside your heart. You find yourself preaching in the showers and talking to people about Christ, and one day I just surrender myself to him. Wow. <laughs> Have you still considering fighting, Mike? Or? Yes, I do, <laughs> but I'm fighting for God now. <laughs> <laughs> That's a different fight. <laughs> well, excellent. And so you said you've been, you've been a man of God for over 20 years? Yeah, I've been uh, preaching about 20 years. I've been saved since I was 12 years old. Oh, wow. Wow. And I'm way over the hill. <laughs> <laughs> we want to explore that. Thank you. All right. Now we're going to the other tough question. Why do bad things happen to good people? People sometimes wonder. Uh, we had that tragedy a couple days ago in Israel uh, mm. where they ended up, uh, the, some, some people came in, they knifed and killed a few, a few people that were just innocently sitting around at the synagogue, and they get killed. And people just wonder, why does this happen? Why do bad things happen like that? Number one, I want to express them to you. Why not? I know this sounds kind of cruel. Why not? If it happened to Christ, Jesus Christ died on that cross. If you remember while he was hanging there, God himself came down from heaven and saw his only begotten son. And Jesus said, Father, why do thou uh, forsake me? And the reason why he said it because God turned his back. Jesus didn't do anything wrong. What he did was he had your sin on his shoulder. If you told a lie, you sinned. You stole, you sinned. Look at a woman a different way, you sinned it. So why not bad things shouldn't happen to us? What we should be saying is we can overcome it. Jesus said, trouble and tribulation you're going to have always, but be a good cheer because I have overcame the world. So that's why when bad things come, give God the glory and the praise and watch him work. So, you, so you're saying a lot of good work can come out of these things. Definitely. But it's hard if you are an unbeliever, you can't see it. Well, what could come out of somebody who got cancer? What could? Nobody said, there's no good in it. Yes, it is. Because that person is smiling every day even though they got cancer. They are going through that chemo. They say, you know what? I live another day. And they're happy about it. They say, I give God the praise and the glory. And then there have been times I know for a fact that people had got healed. Who gets the praise and the glory? God. God gets it. Because people say, you had this disease and you're no longer going to have it. So that's why God should get the praise and the glory. That leads me to another question. I know we, I didn't, uh, we didn't discuss this one earlier, but I, I wanted to see what your opinion is or what mm. your, uh, uh, I can't think of the word, curriculum, I guess, <laughs> for lack of better words at the mm. moment. Uh, your belief mm. uh, in, in the Baptist church. It seems in the modern times now, over the last couple centuries, things have changed in the perspective of heaven and hell. Mm -hmm. Hell's become more of an allegory mm -hmm. instead of a real place to go to. Um, some churches still believe hell really does exist. Yes. We go there if we don't believe in Christ. Um, heaven is a place we go if we do believe in Christ. Correct. Um, does your church teach and preach that? Yes. You know, uh, I tell my congregation, I want you out there to think about the same thing. The two things I can guarantee you, as long as you live in this world, you're going to pay taxes. That's a promise. <laughs> and the second thing I can guarantee you, one day you're going to die. It's not the death that we should be afraid of. It's what happened after death. Where do our spirit go? Our spirit got to go somewhere. It got to go somewhere. Now, uh, 
once we accept Christ, we are secure forever. In other words, when we die, Paul said to be absent from the body is to be in the presence of God. You're going to even end up in hell, eternity. But I want to make it clear. Hell was not designed for you or for me. It was designed for the devil and his angels. But if we reject God, we share hell with the devil. If we accept Christ, we share heaven with him. Interesting. <laughs> That's interesting. Now, the hell, I guess, and people have different definitions of hell. What is your definition of hell? Well, is I'll it, give you the Bible definition of it. It's, it's an eternity where you are burning forever. You, you never get no rest. And the Bible said they gashing their teeth. I mean, they're in so much pain. Can you just imagine having a, a thriving toothache or getting a third degree burn and just get worse forever and ever and ever. You never get out. You never get a cooling period. Uh, it reminds me of a story in my Bible. There was a, a rich man by the name of Lazarus and a poor man. And he was at the gate and asked Lazarus for the crumbs. Just the crumbs. Crumbs of bread that fall off his table. Then asked him for the steak. Then asked him for the bread. And the rich man refused to give it to him. The Bible said that the, a dog, a D-O-G, a dog came it had more compassion than the rich man. It licked Lazarus' wound. Lazarus died that night. And also, the rich man died. Now, the Bible said, Lazarus went home to be in the bosom of Abraham. When the rich man woke up and realized he was in hell, he looked up and saw uh, Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham and asked him, can Lazarus take his finger and just in a bucket or cup of water and just put it on my tongue? And Abraham, I mean, uh, Father Abraham told him no. He couldn't do it. So just imagine he if you want to go there. <laughs> and by the way, I do no visitation in hell. <laughs> <laughs> now, on the other note, is, uh, we'll leave hell for a minute and we'll head over to heaven. What does heaven look like? Heaven is peaceful. It's where God is, the glory of God. Can you imagine being in a holy place? I think Peter said, God said, be holy because I am holy. Can you imagine somewhere in your home where you all by yourself and it's just so peaceful and so joyful. Your husband come home, your children, everybody is pleasant. Well, it's a hundred times better than that. You are in the presence of the creator, the one who created the heavens and the earth and the one who created you. So you're in a heavenly place where the streets is made of gold. Uh, you never got to worry about Food, and never worry about getting sick again. And just imagine always praising and giving God the glory. No taxes. No taxes whatsoever. No taxes. <laughs> well, that's great. Okay, so we tackled those two pretty easily, and I knew you would. <laughs> what does God provide us, and what do bad things happen to good people? So we talked about heaven and hell. There are some religions that believe there's a purgatory, a middle ground. Mm. And this kind of leads me to, to two questions. One question is, is there a middle area between heaven and hell? And what happens to those individuals that are born before Christ? Oh, good question. For number one, there's no middle division. It's even one or, or the other. You even save or you're not saved. Save is the one that's going to go going to go to enter heaven. Can you define saved? Saved is when you have Ask God to secure your salvation. Your salvation is where well, you're going to spend eternity forever when you die. Give a good example. Give a good parable. A lot of people in today's in America buy life insurance. Why do they buy life insurance? They don't need it right now. They didn't need it yesterday. If they ever get in an accident, their house burn or car accident, the life insurance will cover them. Salvation covers you. In other words, you accepted Christ. You invited him into your life. You're going through something, Lord, right now, I want to, uh, to invite you to come in my life. Then the Bible said that you are sealed to the day of redemption. Now, i got to make this straight. Because you become saved, it doesn't make you perfect. It doesn't make you feel like uh, uh, you're so perfect. You're still going to mess up. That's where repentance come in. Father, forgive me today. I sinned. I lied. I did something wrong. So once you're saved... You are secure with Christ forever. Now, i got to clarify this. 
God is so different from us. He's not an Indian giver. How many times we've been mad at somebody, we gave them something, and then we took it back. God doesn't do that. When we mess up, it hurts God. But when you say, Father, I'm sorry, God takes you back just like you was. That's nice to know. It's really nice. <laughs> All right. We're going to discuss a little bit more. What does God say about us helping the unfortunate? And if we have an all-loving God, why are they homeless? Hi, welcome to Adelante. This is Adelante Recovery, and my name is Yvette Kuglin, and I'm part of the staff. Adelante Recovery Center has helped people in dual diagnosis for five years. We accept most PPO insurances and provide luxury accommodations and 24-hour support. To speak with an admissions counselor, call 1-888-242-4450. A lot of time, we don't even know what's wrong with us, and sometimes we need to get away to figure that out. So if you want to go for a little retreat out in Corona Del Mar, which is a confidential location, we're here to help. So... We're only a phone call away. Thank you. We're on part two of religion with Reverend Michael Whitfield. Thank you very much, Reverend, for joining us. Thank you, Mr. Carlos. In part one, we talked about what does God provide us that we can't get anywhere else, and he provided a very simple and precise answer. We also talked about why do bad things happen to good people, which he also answered with relative ease. <laughs> Pastor Reverend Whitfield has that unique ability, and we have some more difficult questions for him. But the first one right off the gate is, does God say to help the unfortunate? We assume he does. God's an all-loving God. Yes. But does he say it? Yes. Do. Jesus said that, he said, if somebody uh, need uh, your shirt, don't only get them your shirt. Give them your jacket. If they need some shoes, get them your shoes. I remember a few years ago, as I stated, that even I was going through my own uh, situation in my life, I seen a young man on the bus with no shoes on. Mm. I took my shoes off and gave them to him. Did you really? I, I, yeah, because in my house, I have maybe 15, 20 pairs of shoes. I can only wear one at a time. <laughs> and, and why not be a help to somebody else that don't have it at all? He didn't ask for one. I just volunteered to give. And that's what God wants us to do. God wants us to be able to give to people that's in need. What do you think the world would be like if there were more Reverend Whitfield actions like that? Well, my wife said that the world would be broke. <laughs> <laughs> because literally, I, I literally give away my paycheck to help people pay the light bill. If someone's going to lose their car, uh, my church helps a lot. I thank God for the New True Faith family and, and for the deacons and how we help the people in the community. There have been times that uh, we had to pay people light bill, pay people car payment, pay people rent. Uh, mm -hmm. Otherwise, they would have been homeless. So I'm always a giver. The Bible said, and Jesus said, it's better to give than to receive. And something happened to a person when they give from their heart. That's a warm feeling. That is a warm feeling. Very, very warm. Now, I want to go back to a little bit about that to the homeless. I know there are two different sides to that story. Mm. There are the homeless who, unfortunately, from whatever circumstances happened, mm. became homeless. Right. I know we've talked about that with you. Right. And sometimes that's something they can't help at the time. And it's a very brief time. Maybe it's a long time, just depending on the situation. But then there are others who are homeless that can do something but won't do something. Mm. Does God say to help those as well? No. But the Bible think a person that's lazy or the Bible said loafiness, that someone that can do something, it's a sin. For the Bible says this in the book of Thessalonians that if a man don't work, a man don't eat. It's just that simple. If you are able to work, you should be able to go get a job. Now, let's be real. Even though we're in hard time, you might not find a job you want. You might have to work at McDonald's, Burger King. You might have to work at those until you get something better. If you would take that little, God will multiply the rest. But you got to make that first step. Mm -hmm. No excuse because, well, I got a college degree. I remember my son, Michael Jr., got out of college, and he was frustrated. And he said, Dad, I'm $50,000 in debt. 
I'm in my early 20s, and I can't even get a job. And I said, son, just pray and have faith. And now my son is working for the state, doing, a, doing great. That's fantastic. <laughs> so it's really about faith. It's about faith. And it reminds me a lot about the story of Job. Because ah. Job seems to have gone through a lot of trials. And I don't remember exactly, but I know there, uh, the beginning he didn't challenge God. Exactly. But did he at the end? Yes. He, Job had three friends, and we all got some friends. And Job had three friends that tried to make him feel, why did you sin? In biblical time, a person would get very sick like that because they had sinned against God. And they're trying to convince Job that he did something. And Job said, hey, I didn't do anything. But when Job got a chance to talk to God, and that's when God came and the whirlwind. And, and one thing about talking to God, you can't lay down talking to God. God told Job, Job, get up. Sit yourself up. And when you talk to God, <laughs> you need to be in your right frame of mind. Let me tell you something about Job. Job is one of my favorite books in the Old Testament. And God said to Job, Job, I'll tell you what. I'm going to answer any question you ask me. But first, I'm going to ask you a question. He said, where was you, Job? When I made the stars, where was you when I made the moon? Where was you when I made this universe? And Job could not give God an answer. The only thing he could have said, Father, I'm sorry. And, and why did God ask him those questions? Because sometimes God had to let us realize, I, I am in control. I know everything. I know, what, I know what you're going through. The problem is, Job did not understand why he was going through it. He couldn't understand why... The rich was getting richer. Why they was seeing that they was prospering. And Job felt like, God, I pray every day. I sacrifice for my children. And yet I'm getting sick and I'm, I'm, my wife wants to leave me. She wants me to curse you and die. Uh, I'm broke. Job couldn't understand that. As, as I told you in the last section that we had, but to give God the glory. Once God got the glory, Job got double for his trouble. Double for his trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like you're, you're, um, we only see a snapshot, a Polaroid of what's really going on. Yeah. God sees the beginning and the end of that trouble. Hurt. You know what? I couldn't say it no better. It's like, it's like someone sitting in a kombu and they can see the train track. You're sitting way up there. God sees the beginning where the train going to end. And also he sees where to start from. God sees our life like that. Before we was born... God sees what we're going to be and what we're going to do in our life. He sees everything. Interesting. Okay, great. <laughs> That's why we have to have faith in that. You have to have faith. And actually, you know, before I go to the next question, since we have some good time, what does faith really mean? Faith means, I'll give you a good example. Oh, Mr. Carlos, when you sat down in your chair, did you examine it? Did you look at it and say, well, I don't think a chair going to hold me? You just sat down. You have faith in that chair that that chair is going to hold you. That's, that's, in other words, you have yes. faith in something. When we have faith in God, uh, that means that I never saw God in my life. I seen the work of God. Never saw him. But I believe with not a doubt in my heart that God created this world and that his son Jesus came and died for my sin and died for yours. That's faith. Faith can move mountains. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see here next question if we have an all loving God so we're going to mm. go back to the homeless again why okay. are there homeless people well Jesus said this he said that the poor will be with you always we ain't going to never ever get rid of the poor they're always going to be with us but it does not mean they are forgotten it does not mean every month I thank God for my church family we go to uh uh, a senior citizen home twice a month. They don't have nothing to offer, nothing to give. Every month, twice a month, New True Faith goes there and we preach and minister to them. They have nothing. Why do I go? I, it's no financial benefit because God tells us to go and take care of them. We should take care of the poor. The Bible says, and Paul Pacific says, we should take care of the widow. Just for incident, I was kind of disturbed that I found out I had a mother in my church, 80 years old, and I did not realize that she couldn't pay her bills, that she was struggling, that she didn't even have food to eat. Mm. Can you imagine working 
uh, for the government, and all of a sudden you, you find yourself almost homeless. What did we do as a church family? We step up. We say, you know what? We'll make sure you have dinner every day. My church literally cooks or make sure she have dinner every single wow. day. Every day. And not only her. Anybody else that we know is that we can, have, we can only help so many, sure. but we do the best we can with what we have. Sounds like you're doing a great job. Thank you. Another question here. Oh, they're all popping up in my head right now. <laughs> That's good. So we understand that we, we need to help the homeless. Mm -hmm. Well, the unfortunate, the ones who are needy, mm -hmm. really are truly needy, mm -hmm. not lazy. Uh, we've got a little bit of understanding of why there are homeless. Mm -hmm. um, what I want to do is take you back a little bit to uh, Genesis. Okay. And we're going to mm -hmm. leave this topic for now. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll venture out to something new here. So we know we need to have faith. Mm -hmm. So if you had somebody who wasn't a Christian, okay. what would Reverend Whitfield say to that person to not convince them, but to show them why this might be a better choice? First, of all, first thing I would ask them, are you happy in your life right now? Let me tell you, I meet a lot of people every single day. I meet people. They have millions of dollars, millions of dollars. I meet people, they have nothing. Even the one with millions of dollars, trust me, they sit there and talk, Pastor Whitfield, I'm going through this issue of my life. I'm dealing with this. I ask them, have you ever considered talking to God and asking to help you? And, and they are it's like amazing to them. They say, well, I didn't think that God really exists. I said, he help exists. God was here before you was. That person, they have millions of dollars, literally one day decide to trust God. Now, he don't need nothing financially because he's well set. But on the inside, on the inside, mm -hmm. he has nothing. He's broken. A broken spirit will come up to a broken heart. And the devil likes you when you broke down. So when I introduce him to Christ and ask him when he accept Christ as his personal savior, he said yes. And I said, sir, that's the best investment you had just made in your life. Now, the one that don't have. Jesus said this in the book of Matthew. He said, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. He said these. Why would Jesus say that? Why would he say, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. Well, actually, why do you think he said that? Ask me now. Yes. <laughs> I know it's going to turn the table. <laughs> So you're asking me why did he why did he say when I was hungry you fed me when I was thirsty you gave me drink when I was naked you clothed me when I was in jail in prison uh, in the hospital you came by and visited me why would you think he would say that to us he was showing um, that he's watching over us he knows what we do okay. and he were acting the way he wanted us to act exactly you hit it he want us. To be a ex uh, he's an example. He wants us to follow his example. Paul said in Second Corinthians uh, uh, chapter four verse seventeen. He said Paul said this specific. He said, "Follow me as I follow Christ." That means let me be your example, and that's what we're supposed to do. In other words, if Jesus helped the poor, we should help the poor. Perfect. <laughs> that's great. So we know now, just for a little bit of clarification before I move on, um, that can happen to anybody with money or without money. The brokenness of yes. the heart. Yes, okay. it can. It, it, it's, it's, it's just those that got money, they can find themselves more someone to talk to or they try to find another way out. Those that don't have it, they turn to drugs. They turn to drugs so they don't have to deal with the real life issues. Hmm. So, so the, the, okay. So the wealthy tend to have a, a way to, they feel more secure, they have more comfort, they have more security in their life, I guess. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. All right. So we know what you were saying earlier about uh, why people should convert to God, mm -hmm. provide them security, eternal, mm -hmm. uh, eternal security, you even mentioned life insurance in a sense. Right. Right. But there is something else in, in regards, when you believe in God, there's a commitment that has to be made. Yes. It's not, it's not simply saying, oh, I believe in God, I'm walking away. Exactly. And what is that commitment that he requires of us? It's like being married. I'm married to my wife. I made a commitment that I will be with her through sickness, through uh, any financial issue that we may have, even uh, family problems. It's a commitment. When you make a commitment to God, God makes a commitment to you. 
God never left Israel. When Moses led the people from Egypt, God never turned his back. They turned their back on God. God said, I'm holy, so be holy. God said, I be your God, and you be my people. God never turned his back on them. They turned their back on him. So God have a commitment. If God tells you he's going to do it, he's going to do it. The book of Ecclesiastes says, it's best not to promise God nothing, to make no vow to God if you're not going to keep it. So when you make a commitment, we need to keep our commitment to God, because God keeps his. Let's go. <laughs> Last question, simple question. People always wonder, how do we pray? Very, very simple. A lot of people think that we pray just fall on our knees. But sometimes when I'm driving down the highway, going back and forth, when I'm going through the community seeing that young prostitute or seeing that young man selling drugs, when I'm seeing people that mistreating people, I actually stop and pray. I pray and ask God, you know, Lord, bless them. Show them the right way. So praying is not only just fall on your knees. It's just any time. It's a communication with God. We have to know what else prayer. Prayer is a communication with God. The only way, the only way you can talk to God is through prayer. That's talking to God. And now the next question would be, Pastor, how do God talk to me? God talks to you through the Word. That's His Bible. 66 books. You read the Bible every day and God will speak to you. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Reverend Whitfield, for coming thank out. You, Carlos. That was so wonderful. Much. And thank you for joining us. I hope you learned a lot. I sure did. We'll see you on the next show. See you later, everyone.